Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to NISCADIF 2023 Day of Action Teaching Series Part 1, Need to Know Logistics. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. My name is Brittany Galati. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Public Policy Coordinator for the New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. I would like to welcome everyone to Part 1 of our series. Before we start the presentation, I would like to go over some housekeeping items. For any questions or comments that may come up during the presentation, please use the chat box. We will do our best to answer questions as they come in. If you would like your question read anonymously, please send a direct chat message to myself or to Lauren Pierce and let us know that you would like it read anonymously. Automated captioning is available for today's presentation. If you'd like to access captions, click on the more menu, select captions, and finish the process from there. I do wanna note that we are recording this meeting and you can review the recording on NISCADIP's Day of Action webpage. It should be uploaded by the end of this week. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Joan Gerhardt, Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany, for your help today and Lauren as well. Welcome everyone to the first um, in a series of three uh, webinar to talk about our 2023 Day of Action. Um, you might notice two things right at the outset uh, for those of you who have participated in this event in the past. We used to call this Legislative Day of Action, and this year there is no legislative. <laughs> and that's a very intentional decision that we made to remove legislative because we really want to focus on um, issues that might not have a legislative connection. Those pertaining to funding, um, living wages, contract reform. So all very large statewide issues, but that don't necessarily have a legislative component. Now that's not to say we're not talking about legislation. Um, our second teaching series, part two, uh, which will be held on Thursday at 2.30. We'll talk about some legislation that we'd like you all to be informed about and to discuss with legislators. Um, but our real focus this year is going to be on DV funding, contract reform, and living wages. You're going to hear me say that a lot. So because of that change in our messaging for this year's event, we are restructuring the day a little bit. We're still going to be in Albany. We're in person. Yay, I should say. <laughs> we're in person. Um, since you know 2019, we haven't been able to be in person, so we're very excited to be back in the legislative office building. Um, so, so that is back to where we were, but what we're doing in Albany is changing a little bit. And I want to thank everyone who helped weigh in on our decision making on what to do with this year's day of action to switch it up because we did ask many of you for your input on what would make the most sense this year. So um, to, to think about the actual day of action event, um, we're still coming to Albany in the morning. We're giving folks enough time to actually get here. So we're gonna start with some registration between 10 and 10.30. But our morning program is going to be substantially different. In the past, we've loved to hear from our legislators, from folks like Governor Hochul when she was lieutenant governor, from Tish James, um, from uh, Senator Kruger, from Assemblywoman Weinstein, and a whole bunch of others to join us in the well to speak to us. So we were listening to them tell us what they were doing on our behalf and on behalf of domestic violence survivors. Their dedication, their commitment, all good stuff, right? But we're still in the position where we're at. We're in crises. And frankly, I, I'm not comfortable hearing um, a lot of words anymore. I think we really have to take significant action to wake the state up to the crisis that we're in. So the morning is going to be more like a rally event for domestic violence advocates, our allies, for survivors, to talk amongst ourselves 
about these issues of funding, to hear from allied organizations about how these same issues impact them, because it's not just domestic violence services, it's many other human service, human services as well. And after we have that morning session, more like a rally, posters, hopefully everyone wears purple, so we can physically be connected, you know, in appearance. We're going to march together as a group through the Capitol, through the LOB to the Capitol, and have a press conference at the Million Dollar Staircase, which is the third floor of the Capitol, where our legislative allies will join us in demanding change, demanding more funding, demanding contract reform, demanding living wages for advocates. So a very different kind of event this year than in years past. Now the afternoon, we'll still have time to meet with legislators and we still ask programs who don't have an opportunity to meet with legislators in other venues, because we have heard that, you know, there are some programs who have great accessibility to their legislators. So there might not be a need to schedule a meeting on this day for that purpose. But we know there are programs who don't have that opportunity. So each program will have to decide for themselves whether it makes sense to schedule meetings with their legislators in the afternoon. But we also have the activities um, that we've done in the past when we've been in person. We know both the Assembly and Senate will be passing resolutions um, designating May 2nd as Domestic Violence Awareness and Prevention Day. And we hope that both chambers will be passing domestic violence related legislation. We've provided each chamber with about a dozen or so bills that we'd like to see passed. So we're, we're hoping that they, we don't really ever get confirmation that they're gonna move ahead with that until we see a press release. <laughs> so it's a little unfortunate we can't plan for that. Uh, but that's essentially our day. We are putting together um, our speaking list for that morning rally. But I think, you know, for those of you who are familiar with Albany activities, this might look a little bit less like an initiative event and more like a union event, because that's what we're hoping. We're hoping with, you know, we'll be there with posters being kind of loud for our group. You know, we tend not to get too loud. On May 2nd, we wanna be loud. And we really want to make the case for the state to give us funding, to change the way that they contract with us, or actually just abide by their the provisions that they're supposed to be held by, as well as living wages. So um, the, before I move on, I did want to mention that um, in some years we have been able to provide food, either in terms of breakfast or a lunch, um, because of sponsors that we've had assisting us. This year, unfortunately, we won't be able to do that. So breakfast and lunch will be on your own. Um, I do in the slides have here a map of um, the Albany concourse, which is the white strip that's in the center of the screen running side by side. Um, just so for those of you who might be unfamiliar with Albany, have this map available to you. It's a little hard to understand where you are, but if you look at the two brown structures to the right with stars, the one at the, at the top of the page is the legislative office building, and the one at the far right is the Capitol building. So I wanted you to, to be able to have this for reference. Um, if you're able to come in off of 787 into the concourse and park in the visitor's lot, which is P3, you will take an elevator to the concourse that's pressing C on the elevator button, and that brings you into this white area, the concourse. So I don't know where you're gonna park your car along this concourse. It can be anywhere, depending on where you decide to park once you're in that underground area. Um, 
but take a note of which number is on the elevator that you're in. So you know, you can remember where you parked your car because it actually is a pretty large parking lot under this concourse. There is security that you're going to have to go through from the concourse to the legislative office building, which is where our morning program begins. Just keep in mind, security lines tend to be long, particularly on Tuesdays. Leave yourself enough time, pack light, because everything does go through, you know, the, the um, readers there. Um, you might wanna bring some snacks with you or a bottle of water because there's not that much available. There is a Dunkin' Donuts on the other side of security, but there's not a lot of food options. You'll have to go out of security into the concourse to get lunch um, if you have time to do that. So it might be wise to just bring some snacks with you. And again, if you have any assistance with the, if you, if you have any questions about this at all, just reach out to me or Brittany. Our emails are at the end of these slides and we're happy to walk you through it in greater detail. There's also a map of um, other available parking lots around the Capitol and Legislative Office building. If you're unable to get a spot in P3, it does fill up fairly early. Um, you know, you might want to download that map before you come to Albany so you're prepared if that parking lot is full. So let's get to the meat of what we really want to share with legislators. Um, we're gonna be going over this during our rally. We're gonna be hearing from different speakers talking about different aspects of this information. But it, what, what it really comes down to is a lack of funding, right? It's a lack of funding. New York hasn't dedicated sufficient resources to meet the demand for domestic violence services. We know we have the highest demand for services in the country. And this will be, um, I should have mentioned earlier, we, will, we are in the process of finishing um, all of the materials you will need to successfully participate in Day of Action. We have a number of materials for participants, as well as materials that can be left as leave behinds for legislators. So for participants, we're preparing talking points on all of this, this messaging. So you don't, don't feel the need to take notes. Um, there'll be information about the legislation that we'll be talking about on Thursday. There'll be best practice for rallying, which is the topic of our third teach-in series on next Monday, also at 2.30. So um, you'll, we should be posting all of those materials to our Niscative Day of Action webpage by the end of the week, which we're hoping gives you all enough time to prepare. And in those materials, there'll be information about the last NNEDV Domestic Violence Counts Survey, which is the annual survey NNEDV does across the country every year, which consistently shows New York having the highest demand for domestic violence services in the country. And what I certainly don't need to tell all of you is how even having the highest demand for services in the country then during the pandemic spiked extraordinarily, you know, extraordinarily high um, in 2020 and has yet to come down. So we are at that heightened increase um, even, even being the highest before the pandemic started, now being doubly as high. Um, it's, it's really, the demand is there. And yet because of stagnant or cut funding, we can't provide services to everyone who's looking at, you know, looking for them. For that census last year, September of 2022, there were nearly a thousand victims who were looking for help, who could not get services from us. Now, almost over 9,000 did. So I don't mean to convey no one got services, but 1,000 did not. So when you think about that, how that translates to a full year, that was just one day. We're looking at hundreds of thousands of people asking for services and not getting them. And then when you even think about the survivors who aren't even turning 
to domestic violence service providers. You know, maybe they heard that there's long wait lists or they can't get into shelter. So it's just an astronomical issue. We're really, frankly, at a tipping point. We know that domestic violence programs cannot provide survivor-centered, trauma-informed services because of this antiquated method that New York has for funding domestic violence services. Now, there's a lot packed in to this one statement, right? There's a lot. So I just want to unpack it a little bit for you. Again, this will be in your materials. But we want the state, we want legislators to understand that most of the funding that flows to domestic violence programs comes to us through shelter, right? Domestic violence survivors have to go to shelter, not in all circumstances, of course, right? We do provide non-residential services, but when you look at the way the funding is distributed, the state under significantly undervalues non-residential services. We prioritize shelter. Even though we know not every survivor gets into a shelter because of lack of availability of beds. Maybe it's that a program can't provide services to the unique needs of a particular survivor. So there's a whole host of reasons why we don't want the funding flowing to domestic violence programs through shelter alone. And all of our efforts to increase funding for non-residential services by I think not a lot of money have not been answered. Actually, I guess you could say they've said no because they haven't given us the money we've asked for. So when we only get paid when survivors are in shelter, that means external factors can greatly impact the amount of revenue we bring in, like what happened during the pandemic, right? We had no control over survivors who for very valid reasons decided they didn't wanna go into shelter. And then we all saw our occupancy rates decrease 50%, 60%, which greatly impacted the revenue that we received. What do you think New York State did with all that revenue that they weren't giving to us? I don't know, but it didn't come our way. It also means that we can't be survivor-centered when we do house an individual in shelter. What do I mean by that? We can't hold a bed. We can't hold a bed. We can't allow survivors to stay in shelter longer than the maximum permitted by the state. If a survivor needs to go get a medical procedure, they have to enter a hospital for a couple of days. Now that doesn't mean we don't hold a bed. It means the state won't reimburse us for holding the bed. Or if a child needs to go visit with the other parent, court ordered, right? Are we going to give up that bed when the other parent is still in shelter? I don't think so. But we don't get reimbursed for that. And we don't get reimbursed when the counties argue about who's responsible for paying for a shelter stay. Sure, they can take all the time they want in trying to figure out who's responsible. But all that time, we're left essentially holding the bag, not getting paid. It would be one thing if there wasn't a tremendous amount of bureaucracy around New York's funding system, right? Numerous federal funding streams, FIPSA, VAVA, VOCA, TANF, Title 20, all administered by different state agencies, OCFS, OTDA, OVS, DCJS, OPDV, Department of Health, all under different procurements, all having different contract terms, all with different reporting requirements, all with different cycles. We spend so much time on this bureaucracy, so much time challenging the state. Give us the money that you say we ought to be getting. All that time, all those resources should be focused on providing services to survivors. 
Instead, we have large grant writing departments. Those, those programs who are lucky enough to have large grant writing departments, right? We know that often falls on an executive director to do. So the reality for us as domestic violence service providers, we're spending way too much time on paperwork. We're not getting paid for the services that we provide. We have to rely on loans, lines of credit to pay our staff. And as a result, we're not getting staff in the door. Tremendous issues with recruitment and retention. We're unable to fill our vacancies. We can't retain staff because we can't raise wages. And the other thing I think is really important to note is the inability for us to pursue what I categorize as innovative projects. You know, to me, the perfect example of this is years ago, we used to get funding from the state for supervised visitation. And several programs, not all, but several programs had some great supervised visitation projects available to their clients and others in the community. That funding got scrapped for a lot of reasons I won't go into. But where, where did those supervised visitation projects go? They went out the window, right? And now we see the result of that because now every community is, is just grappling with courts ordering individuals to supervise visitation that doesn't exist. So who bears the brunt of all this? Who bears the brunt? It's domestic violence survivors and their families. When we say to them, shelter is the primary option for you to receive services, come into shelter and, and it's the best way for you to get services. That's not survivor centered. They're the ones who are dealing with the long waiting lists. I heard from one program, they had a waiting list of a thousand people for support groups, a thousand people. It means challenges obtaining shelter for single adults, right? Because it's harder. You don't get reimbursed the same for a single adult in a double occupancy room. LGBTQ plus individuals, survivors who have language needs, survivors with disabilities, those with pets. These are the survivors who bear the brunt, right? The state wants us to identify the perfect victims and put them in shelter, but that's not how, what our job is. There is no perfect victim. All of these individuals are worthy of shelter, we know that. But when, they, when there are challenges to having them go into shelter, or if they don't want to enter shelter, that means our services are not accessible to them. But it's very important that we tell the state where we want to go, right? We can't just say we have a big problem here. We have to present the solution. So we want to tell the state we can fix this. We've been talking about this. We know how to fix it. We can look at other states for guidance because they don't have the same challenges we have. We need to assign one state agency to administer this funding for domestic violence services. And we need to supplement the federal funding with state revenues. So the grants are stabilized. If the federal funding that comes in goes wonky one year or two years like the VOCA funding, we don't feel that because we have the state behind us to support us, to prop us up. We need to fully fund our shelters for full-time operations, not just when survivors are in residence. Pay us what it costs to keep the lights on and the staff in the door and the fridge, fridge full, right? And move us away from competing against each other in these competitive procurements that's crazy. What community doesn't need domestic violence services? We all need these services. It should be foundational. And we need the state to execute contracts with us before the contract cycle begins, not six months later, right? And above <laughs> all of that, we need living wages. We need living wages, include, include us. 
when there's a cost of living adjustment. Include us when there are bonuses for human service workers. We're no different. We're frontline essential workers. We deserve the same. And if we haven't gotten it in the past and others have, we should be at the top of the list. We should be first. So I know this is a lot of information, uh, but I do, I do want to just pause and breathe and let everyone know all of this will be in the materials that are available to you. Um, we do this very complicated stuff, but we do want to try to keep this high level for legislators so they really understand. I think the, the more we can talk about the impacts of this on survivors and as us as service providers, you know, we want to tell those stories. We want to tell about how difficult it is to retain staff, talk about the lines of credit and loans we've had to take out, how we can't, you know, have, have maybe we've had to lay off people. And that's what will resonate. You know, we need to bring this to a crisis mode. So before I turn to questions, the last thing I wanted to just make note of is that we are also doing our social media toolkit, which we've done in the past. This would be for use, certainly with any staff who are unable to join us in Albany on May 2nd, but also for those who are in the room, in the well with us, um, to take selfies or, you know, as we march maybe, or at the press conference, you know, to post throughout the event. So there'll be a lot more information about how to do that in our social media toolkit. And this will also be posted um, on our webpage by the end of the week. So Lauren, I know you were gonna look at our chat for us. Is there anything that I, I've been trying to keep tabs on it, anything I need to address? Uh, there are no questions thus far. All right, well, let me encourage anyone who has questions I, I, to, to put something in the chat. I will remind everyone that this is the first um, in a three-part teaching series. The reason why we broke it up this year was we thought it might be easiest for folks to, um, to watch these in smaller snippets um, or to listen to the recordings of these sessions when they were available. Because we know it's it's hard sometimes to get an hour or an hour and a half out of your day. So the second session will be on Thursday, this coming Thursday at 2.30, and we'll focus on legislation 101, um, the four bills that we, um, if you would like to talk to legislators about bills, those are the four that we are highlighting. Although, like I said, we really do want to prioritize our messaging this year around the funding, contracting, and living wage issue. And then our third um, teach-in series, part three, is on Monday, the 24th, also at 2.30. And uh, Brittany will be offering that one, and it's called Rally Like You Mean It. So we haven't really done a rally in the past, so she's going to give us some best practice for uh, participating in a rally as well as a press conference. So I don't think I see anything in the chat and I know we're coming right up on three o'clock. So I will leave it here. Brittany and my emails are here on the slide. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about the material or a meeting with legislators or other um, events of the day, you know, just reach out to us, we'll be happy to help you. Thank you for coming.